This unit of the New Hampshire Network, in its continuing coverage of the first in the nation presidential primary, presents the New Hampshire primary, Democratic presidential debate. Participating are the five candidates whose names appear on the March 7th Democratic ballot. Here is NHN Public Affairs Editor Neil Seavey. Good evening. On Tuesday, New Hampshire voters will have the unique experience of voting for their preference for President of the United States. They will be the first voters in the country to do so as the round of 23 state presidential primaries opens in the Granite State. For better than six months, hopeful presidential candidates have been coming to New Hampshire, talking to voters, giving their views on issues. Now, after all the political rhetoric is coming to a close, the voters will decide who they think will do the best job as President of the United States. The March 7th Democratic ballot lists five candidates, and they are here in the Durham studios of the New Hampshire Network to express their views on the issues. They are Edward Cole of Hartford, Connecticut, Senator George McGovern of South Dakota, Senator Vance Hartke of Indiana, Senator Edmund Muskie of Maine, Mayor Sam Yorty of Los Angeles. The candidates will speak in that order for the opening statements, this being determined by drawing of lots just before the program began. A maximum of four minutes for opening statements will be allowed for each candidate. Following that, three colleagues from the New Hampshire Press and Radio will join me in questioning the candidates. And gentlemen, I'll tell you when you reach the three-minute mark. Mr. Cole, you may begin right now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to politics, 1972. How, however, I think this year we have to look upon politics, not as the politics of 1968 or of the politics of 1964, but the politics of 1960, because that was a different time in America. And that was a time when there was a mission in politics, because a man ran for the presidency called John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I was a college student at that time, but it was a different time in my life because I never heard a president challenge people before. I never heard a president talk about participation before legislation. I never heard a president reach the vibrations of the American public. And all of a sudden, during those three years, politics was exciting, and there was a mission in America. And in short, people were not turned off. Then on that Friday, November, 1963, we all remember. We all remember that day. And I think since that Friday in America, Americans have stopped believing in our abilities to carve a new course for this world. They've stopped believing. They've stopped trying. Now, my campaign is not geared to be a book written about it, such as the making of the president or the selling of the president. What I'm trying to do in this campaign is to set a precedent. What I'm trying to do is to say to the American public is that you must get involved, that we must have more debates, and the debates must not take place just like this tonight, but in your living room and on the campuses. And the theme of my campaign is similar to the campaign of 1968 in that it talks about ending the war. But the war that I'm trying to end is the war that I've been deeply involved in the last eight years of my life the war in America, not the war of the TV studios and all the lights and all the glamour, but the war of Harlem streets and Newark homes and poverty and apathy and the war of real serious social problems where the nation has turned more and more toward violence. And I think that we have to tackle the problem of violence in America if politics in 1972 is going to mean anything. And the number one killer in America is not guns. The number one cause of violence in America is the rat. And this isn't a very pleasant sight. But this is the cause of our violence in America. And this rat can be very symbolic. But this is what causes the Atticas. This is what causes our violence. And until we do something about the rat in America, then I think politics in 1972 is going to be meaningless. Three minutes. One symbol of the rat is politics as usual. 
politics that it does not challenge the American public. And we have not been challenged on three presidential commissions, one the Eisenhower, the other the Scranton, and probably the most important, the Kerner Commission report. And until we study and act upon these reports and tackle the good problems of race in this country and of poverty and of participation, and until we get people running for this office that are going to bring new vitality to this government, we're going to lose the United States of America. And this is the theme of my campaign, to start a revolution. A revolution of reason and involvement, and to the tackle the war on apathy. Ten seconds, and I hope that the candidates here tonight, and in all these primaries, will realize that we must challenge the American public to a new day in America. Thank you. Senator McGovern, you may begin your opening statement now. Early last year, I announced for the presidency with a pledge to seek and to speak the truth. Voters are entitled to know how a presidential candidate handles the hard issues and how he behaves under pressure. Face-to-face -face meetings, such as this one tonight, are a good way to test the capacity and the character of a candidate. <coughs> Furthermore, every person who seeks the presidency should publicly declare his financial interests and the source of every dollar contributed to his entire campaign. I have done this. I believe other presidential candidates should do the same. I have conducted an open campaign based on trust in the people. I would conduct an open presidency. As president, never would I advocate a course on any issue that I was ashamed to defend in public. There is no way for a president to earn public trust unless he himself trusts the public. Beyond this, the next president must recognize that it is not so important to do things for people as it is to create the conditions that help people do things for themselves. This means stopping the terrible waste of unemployment by developing a decent job opportunity for every man and woman in this nation who wants to work. It means we stop robbing the worker's paycheck to finance a needless war that wastes his money and kills his children. It means ending such special interest deals as the oil import quota, which adds $140 a year to the fuel bill of every New England family. It means putting an end to the anxiety of older citizens by assuring every senior citizen of a decent retirement. One matter we all share in common is that someday we will be old. Let us make that a time in our lives that we look forward to, not with dread, but with confidence and joy. Let us also build a country where Every citizen is assured of basic health care through a national comprehensive health insurance program. Let us build a country where our young people are free from the bondage of drugs, of crime, of pollution, and of poor education. To create such opportunities will cost money. How do we do it? I propose two methods. Three minutes, sir. First, we reform our tax structure so that it reduces the huge loopholes for the rich and the powerful. I believe we can save $28 billion a year by closing off such unjustified loopholes as the oil depletion allowance. That $28 billion in savings could be used partly to finance education and partly to reduce the burdensome local property tax. Secondly, we need an efficient, fully adequate national defense, but one that is free of fat and of waste. That means ending the folly of Vietnam and ending it now. It means reducing the 300,000 American troops in Europe at a time when Europe is perfectly capable of providing more of its own military manpower. Ten seconds. I have carefully constructed an alternative budget that would give us a strong national defense while reducing wasted overkill. All candidates talk about new priorities 
but I Thank have you demonstrated much, how to finance these priorities. Thank you, Senator McGovern. Senator Hartke, you may begin now. I'm very pleased about this debate because I've been seeking it since last January. You see, it does not take much courage to come to the state of New Hampshire if you have a $1 million budget, but it does take a lot of courage to face the people face to face. It doesn't take much courage if you go in front of your ad agency, but it does take a lot of courage to go in front of the people. I speak in a way for the heart and soul of America. I speak for those people who have no spokesman. I speak for the elderly, the elderly who suffer because they have a lack of money. The voice of the elderly couple who has to live on $800 a year Social Security and has $300 a year property tax. I speak for the veteran who was sent off to a no-win, no-lose war and who has to come back to a no-job peace. I speak for the shoe worker here in New Hampshire who was thrown out of work because of the imports which are coming into this nation and been swallowed up by 20 cent an hour foreign labor. And I speak for the young, the young who are suffering from the highest unemployment rate in this history, who do not have a cause or an ideal to look forward to. And I speak for the cancer victim. One out of every six listening to this program will be a victim of cancer unless we find a cure. And it will cost you $15,000 to die of cancer. See, I hear these voices. They're the voices that are seldom heard in the political arena, and they're not the big issues maybe that all of the ad agencies and the television experts would have you talk about. But they are the things that the people are telling me. I do not come to you, though, merely and adjust my position. I do not adjust my position on the war, on economics, or upon the future of this nation. I come to you as a person who has worked in the vineyards. I've been in the United States Senate for 13 years. I've been a part of this action arena. I've worked at it hard, and I've been successful. And now I come to you and say that there is no reason why we should not have a guaranteed job for every man who wants to work in this nation. There are six million, six million Americans. There's no reason why we couldn't have them all to work within six months after the next president takes office. I want guaranteed health care, and I was one of the co-sponsors of the Medicare Act, which helped put that program on for the aged. For veterans' benefits, I'm chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee. I've had a chance to be of help to the veterans, to give them disability benefits. And now I say that every veteran of this era should receive the same benefits that I received when I came back from World War II. In Social Security, I think we should have a 20% increase in Social Security now. And the other candidates now adopt that philosophy. But I was responsible for the last 15% increase in Social Security. And I've been responsible for 14 major changes in the Social Security law as a result of my Finance Committee activities. In tax exemptions, I think that the affluent poor, that's most of us, the Three affluent minutes, poor sir. should have at least a $1,000 tax exemption. It used to be 600 and Senator Albert and Gore and I were responsible for it being now $750. And on imports, not a candidate on this platform will support the Hartke Burke bill to limit imports into this nation so that the shoe worker, the textile worker, and the electronic worker will have a job in the future. What I'm talking about is that not alone do I come to you with promises, I come to you with action in the past. I want to seize the initiative for this country, to move it forward, to take us in a new direction, not 10 years from now, but immediately. When that next president takes office, he can provide jobs for those people immediately. He can provide an immediate national health care program. He can provide an immediate drug acceleration research and study program. He can provide all of those things which America so desperately wants and cries for. That's why I'm here, Ten because seconds. my political philosophy is one which is not designed to win just the nomination or the presidency. My political philosophy is designed to make a better America. Thank you, Senator Hartke. Senator Muskie, you may begin now. Good evening. I'm running for president to change the country. I'm committed to end the war in Vietnam. I would set a date for the withdrawal of every American military man, dependent only upon the return of our prisoners of war and the safety of our troops as they leave. We must reduce unemployment and stabilize prices. Nearly five and a half million Americans are out of work, 400,000 of them Vietnam veterans. That isn't good enough. We must guarantee a job 
to every man and woman who wants to work, including those on welfare, in private enterprise if possible, in public service employment if necessary. We must step up the federal government's schedule for building hospitals, schools, and other essential public works in order to create more jobs across the country. I will recommend a comprehensive tax reform program designed to shift the tax burden from those who pay too much, the homeowner and the working man, to those who can afford to pay more. Included will be reform of the Social Security tax system to reduce payroll taxes for workers, a consumer tax credit to put money in the hands of consumers and a sharing of federal revenues to reduce the burden on the property taxpayers. We must restore older Americans to their rightful place in our society. To do this, I favor an immediate 20% increase in Social Security, a national health insurance program, and a new program of housing security to give senior citizens relief from rising property taxes. This is what I will do if I'm elected president. I'm convinced that we can do these things and more. We can do it by changing our country from war to peace and by changing the mood of America from fear and division to trust and cooperation. I was born and raised just 25 miles from New Hampshire I've been coming here all my life. For the past 13 years as a senator, I've been here every year working on our common problems. And I know the people of New Hampshire. On the Portsmouth Naval Yard, Senator McIntyre and I were directly responsible for the 10-year extension that gave us time to reverse the decision to close the yard. Three minutes. On fuel problems, I worked with the entire New England delegation to increase the supply of home heating oil in New England at lower cost to each of you. As governor and senator, I've worked to create new jobs for northern New England and to preserve existing jobs. I was one of the principal sponsors of the Area Redevelopment and Economic Development Acts both of which have been used effectively to create jobs here. I wrote the Orderly Marketing Act, which was designed to preserve the jobs of New Hampshire shoe workers and textile workers, and have fought for 10 years to get that enacted into law. 10 seconds. I've written every major piece of legislation enacted by the Congress in the past 10 years dealing with air and water pollution. These aren't promises. Thank you very much, This Senator. is a record. Mayor Yorty, you may begin your opening statement now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I realized that when I first came here to New Hampshire, uh, many people had heard very little about me. But actually, I've had a longer record in the political field than any of these gentlemen, including the three senators. I started my political career in 1936. My first career ended in 1940 when I advocated a declaration of war on Hitler to save Britain and France, who were still trying to carry on the fight. I predicted at that time that if we didn't see the danger coming to us, that we would be attacked. And unfortunately, I was right in what I said, but uh, we were uh, not prepared, as I had predicted, and many people did not live out their lives because they wouldn't listen to the true facts and the politicians in Washington weren't telling them the facts. The young people might be interested in knowing that in 1939, I advocated that uh, they be given the vote at the age of 18 because I said they're going to be in a war and they won't even have a chance to vote on how they feel about it. And of course, you know, Los Angeles is uh, by itself bigger than half the states. And uh, having served in the legislature, then I went back to the legislature, then to Congress. And finally, I'm in my third four-year term as mayor of Los Angeles, the only Democrat ever to be elected for such a long time. Now, as far as I'm concerned, these uh, senators don't have much to argue about. I think their records are approximately the same on all of the issues. I regard them as members of the left wing 
a liberal bloc in the Senate and uh, checking on their records. I, I couldn't see how they could debate each other, but I could see how they could debate me. I don't think that the, the people of the country are going to turn the, the government back to the Democratic Party unless we provide moderate leadership. And I would like to go back to the moderation of President Harry Truman. I don't like to see politicians who change when the political wind changes. And uh, all of the senators, of course, were for the war at one time. They're all on record as voting for the supplemental appropriation of the Defense Department in 1967 with a strong statement on Vietnam. I have never changed my views on Vietnam. From the very first, I've said that our objective is honorable. The objective was set by President John F. Kennedy, and it was an honorable decision. We went in there to help those people defend themselves and to keep Southeast Asia from falling under communism. And while I've never approved, uh, while I've always approved of the conduct of the war, I have never approved, uh, never approved of the conduct of the war, but our objective, yes. And I've said so publicly. I didn't change my view when the public soured on the long, drawn-out war. I went to President Johnson as early as 1965 and urged him to let Americans use our air power and our technology and knock out the targets in North Vietnam, such as the Haiphong Harbor. And I even said to him one time in almost exasperation, I said, Mr. President, in my opinion, you have no right to send young 19-year-old Americans out to Vietnam to risk their lives under your political restrictions. And while I was doing that, of course, Senator Muskie now admits that he told President Johnson if he stopped the bombing, there would be meaningful negotiations. And as I've said publicly, and Three I don't minutes. mind saying to the Senator, Senator, I think that was very naive. He admits he was wrong, but some of the rest of us uh, were against that decision to stop the bombing because we think we had the communists on the run about that time, and they had to give up, except they got the bombing stopped. Well, there are many places where I differ with these senators. The objective, I say, is honorable. The conduct, I never have. And then when you get to the matter of some of the other things, of course, I want to say this first, that Nixon, too, takes advantage uh, of the war with his Vietnamization because the idea of training the South Vietnamese to defend themselves was not his idea. That started back in 1961 when we first sent advice, advisors in. It was our objective then to train those people to defend themselves just as we had uh, in Korea. Now, I believe that we're going to have to spend more money Ten on national defense. And, of course, these senators are all on record as voting to cut national defense. But also, they all voted against a supersonic transport airplane, which meant 50,000 jobs. And Thank here's an much, ad Mayor from, the Russia, from uh, Aviation Weekly, an Thank American you, Mayor magazine, Your time is with up. the Russians advertising Thank their plane. Thank you very plane. much. Okay. We've well, just heard the opening statements by the Democratic candidates in the March 7th New Hampshire presidential primary. To move to the second part of the program, newsmen representing the press and broadcasting in the state will put questions to the candidates. With me are Richard Noyes, who is editor and publisher of the weekly Salem New Hampshire Observer, Peter Morrison, news director, WKBR Radio Manchester, Rod Paul of the Concord Monitor. Dick Noyes will begin with a question for all of the candidates. And gentlemen, you will have one minute in which to answer the question and make any comments you so desire. I'll tell you when 45 seconds have passed and when your time is up. Since uh, Mr. Cole began with the opening statements by agreement, we'll move to the man who drew number two at position, Senator McGovern. Dick Noyes, what's your question? Uh, gentlemen, your, your uh, presentations are winning but New Hampshire people have had uh, history in recent years of disenchantment with both state and national candidates who say before election one thing and do something else. What reason do we here in New Hampshire have to believe that you individually are different? Well, in my own uh, case, Mr. Noyes, uh, let me say that uh, my record has been one of consistency on the crucial questions that we've been talking about uh, here tonight. Uh, unlike uh, the charge Mayor Yorty made about uh, certain senators uh, shifting their position on the war, I took a position against this war in 1963 when the polls showed that it was very unpopular uh, to oppose our involvement in Southeast Asia, and I've held uh, steadily uh, to that cause. There is no point uh, in my public record where I've made a pledge uh, before an election in order to win votes that I haven't done the very best within my power uh, to carry cents. out that pledge uh, once the election was over. And I place above everything else uh, in this campaign a determination 
uh, to match my performance with my promise. Senator Hartke? Let me be specific in three areas. In the first place, I promise that I would give you a $1,000 exemption if I'm elected for every person, his wife, and his children. As I said in my opening statement, the increase from $600 to $750 is the best evidence that I believe in this policy. It was successful on the floor of the Senate for me to pass an $800 exemption. But when it got to the conference committee, controlled even by the Democrats, under a threat of ex veto from President Nixon, the $800 exemption was taken out. I still believe every person should have a $1,000 exemption. In Social Security, in this field, I'm on the Finance Committee, and it's my bills, 49 separate amendments that are waiting for action there. Seconds. And it is a recognized fact that those are the bills which are going to be acted on when we take up the Social Security bill in Congress this year. So when these people talk about a 20% increase in Social Security, when they talk about medicine under, med under Medicare... Thank you very much, Senator. Senator Muskie, you may respond. Well, every voter, you know, I suppose, could select one of three standards in voting for a candidate. Either vote for a candidate who's never made a mistake, or vote for a candidate who makes mistakes but doesn't admit them, or vote for a candidate who makes mistakes and concedes them publicly. I suspect uh, that the last standard is the only one that really fits those of us who are sitting here. The three senators who are here, for example, all voted for the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, all voted against repealing it in 1966, all have a different view of the war today than they had in 1966. And I think it's a mark of the flexibility and responsiveness of, of our system that uh, the Senate of the United States has responded, you know, to the change in the conditions of the war and the change in the public's comprehension of the war. With respect to the principal issues which I've outlined in my opening statement, my record of 25 years in public life Thank demonstrates you, my consistency on those points. Well, I'm glad to see the senators, uh, at least Senator Muskie, admitting that he was wrong about uh, the war in Vietnam. And I'm glad to say again that uh, I've been consistent uh, in the field of national defense going clear back to 1939 and 40. And I've also been consistent in trying to get jobs, as I didn't get to in my opening statement. I tried to get the supersonic transport made in the United States <coughs> the project completed. But the Senate, with all these senators voting against it, cut that project off. And so the Americans are not building supersonic transports. And the people who build them will not be buying shoes in New Hampshire or clothes made from cloth made in New Hampshire. They'll be buying them in Russia or in Europe. Here's the ad in the American Aviation Weekly advertising. It says the Lunacode No, which was the uh, Russian uh, lunar lander, the TU-144, yes. That is the Russian-made supersonic transport, and they are trying now to sell it to the airlines of the United States. So we lost like 50,000 jobs directly, plus all the, the other jobs that would have resulted. Thank you, Mayor Yorty. Mr. Cole? I guess I'm different in many ways. Uh, one thing, I'm 32, so I cannot be elected president. The other thing, I guess that I'm single. I suppose you should be married. I guess I'm taking care of that this Saturday. <laughs> But I have different thoughts than Mayor Loeb, or is it Yorty? Uh, I forget, I get you mixed up sometime, but I'm glad we're getting out of Vietnam. I'm real glad. And 50,000 young men are over there and, you know, dead because of that mess. And uh, I got to think, I got to say something about Senator McGovern. At least he had the vision in 63 to say, get out of there. Get out of that mess. And I think that's important that he did say something. Well, one thing that some of the senators, in fact, all the senators, and and Mary, you already didn't say much about was broad-based income tax. And that would have helped the working man in this state. And labor people in other parts mm -hmm. of this nation recognize it. And I think this is an important thing because I spoke out on that while others were silent. We'll begin this round of questioning with uh, Senator Hartke, and the question will be asked by Pete Morrison. <clears throat> Gentlemen, would you agree that our country's number one priority in Southeast Asia now would be the safe return of American prisoners of war. If so, how would you do it? If not, what do you feel our priority should be? 
Number one priority in Vietnam is to end this terrible tragedy at the earliest possible moment, bring home our prisoners of war, and stop wasting our treasure, our manpower, and our material in that part of the world. But that only is the beginning. That ends only the involvement. Does not do anything to get on with the unfinished business of America. We have unemployed people here who need attention. We need a nation which needs to be challenged to do its best. We need a nation which is challenged to do its best, not alone in space, not alone in military affairs, but in health, in job opportunities, in every single living thing that we're doing. America's in second gear. What we need to do is put this country back in high gear again and make it move in a fashion which Americans love. That is, to go forward with every bit of our energy at our command. Fifteen seconds. Thank you. Senator Muskie? I don't think there's much disagreement among the great majority of American people that the number one priority is to end the war, our own involvement, and contribute what we can to ending the war, not only because it's wrong, but because it stands between us and our own future. It has worked to divide us among ourselves. It has diverted our resources from important responsibilities and tasks here at home. Consider the last three years, for example. We've spent $50 billion directly in these three years of so-called winding down the war, $50 billion we couldn't spend here on jobs and housing, cleaner cities, racial problems, and so on. We've lost another $50 billion in lost revenues attributable to unemployment. That, too, we did not have to spend here at home. Yes, ending the war, which stands between us and our own future, is the number one priority. Mayor Yorty? Well, I had a letter the other day from uh, an organization headed by Mr. McCain, whose brother is a prisoner of war. And he said that uh, I was the only candidate that seemed to really care about the issue enough to go out and try and do something. Of course, no one knows just how to get these prisoners home. You can't take a chance on the promises of the communists. Matter of fact, the communists in North Vietnam don't even call them prisoners of war. They call them bandits. They've refused to let the International Red Cross go in and see uh, how they're doing there and how they're treated or even to identify all of them. I wrote to Kurt Waldheim, the new Secretary General of the United Nations, and asked him to bring this subject up uh, in the United Nations uh, on his own. He wrote back and said he thought it was more for the uh, Paris peace talks. But if I were president, I would insist that the United Nations take this matter up seconds. and try and get them to insist that our prisoners be allowed to be visited by the International Red Cross now. Mr. Cole. Vietnam. <clears throat> We'd set a date to get out of Vietnam. But many people, as immoral as that war is, don't realize that we're using the Vietnam War as a scapegoat in many ways. Common Cause comes out with a poll today that said 95% of its people felt that the war in Vietnam was the top priority. But what about the war in this country, the war of personalization, the war to get this government close to the people? This is what we have to do. We've got to get the people believing again in this country, and it's not just that war. We've got to do something about the division in America. That's got to be the theme of this campaign. It's not going to depend on these men. It's going to depend on the American public doing something seconds. about the problems of division and politics, as usual, becoming relevant. And this campaign in New Hampshire has not really challenged the people in New Hampshire or America. And the networks have to take a look at the war in America and put down on those pages the 112 policemen in Life magazine Thank you, sir. who died in America Thank you, last Mr. Cole. Year. Senator McGovern? I don't have the slightest doubt that if I were president of the United States, I could set a definite date for the ending of this war that would lead to the release of our prisoners and the return of all of our forces, and we could accomplish that within 90 days' time. But I want to add that I think it's misleading for Senator Muskie to leave the implication that all of the senators have about the same record on this war because we voted for the Gulf of Tonkin resolution eight years ago. It was not that resolution that involved this country uh, in Vietnam. We voted for the Gulf of Tonkin under the mistaken impression that American ships had been attacked on the high seas. That was an act of deception on the part of the Johnson administration, and I have consistently attacked this policy from that day to this. So there is a difference between senators. My friend, uh, Senator Muskie, as a matter of fact, as late as the convention of 1968, 
was defending the Johnson war plank on Vietnam Thank you very while much, I was Senator trying McGovern. to end the war. We go into our third round of questioning, with, uh, beginning with Senator Mc, uh, Muskie and the question asked by Rod Paul of the Concord Monitor. Gentlemen, the focus of the campaign has been on Asia. I'm interested to know your thoughts on Europe. Specifically, uh, what would each of you gentlemen do to enhance our relationship with Europe with, and direct your questions with the emphasis on how we should react to a strengthening common market? Senator Muskie. Well, I think that with respect to the economic relationships between us and Europe, we need to concentrate on developing better institutions uh, to minimize the possibilities of economic friction between the common market and the United States. <clears throat> the common market potentially, when it's reached full development, could be a stronger economic force than we are. We're going to be in competition at points that are not now visible as well as at points that are now visible. So I think what we need are not only the present institutions aimed at expanding trade, but other institutions and policies aimed at assisting the member countries, and by that I mean the United States and the common market countries, to adjust to the realities of, of trade. I mean, trade can have a disruptive effect on internal economies, as it does here in northern New England. I talked to Chancellor Willie Brandt about this problem a year ago, and he agreed with me Thank that you, we Senator needed Muskie. such an institution. Mayor Yorty? Let me say that when Senator Muskie said all the senators vote alike, that he was certainly right on the 1967 Defense Appropriations Bill, for which Senator McGovern voted. And here it is right here. I have a copy of the congressional record with a very strong statement on Vietnam. But uh, in dealing with Europe, I've always felt that we have to have a close partnership with the uh, free nations of Europe. And uh, I realize that, of course, uh, we are uh, free enterprise nations and we're competitive. Uh, and uh, there are some places where there have been discrimination uh, against the United States. We've been a, almost a free place where they could sell their products, where in many cases they've discriminated against us. Uh, they also have the advantage uh, over there of deducting uh, some of the taxes when they export products under the added value tax. Seconds. And due to the technicalities in the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, we can't do that. So some of these disadvantages we have to remove and then work with them on a reciprocal basis to improve our trade uh, and see that we're not the dumping ground because for their products. Thank you, Mayor Yorty. Against. Mr. Cole, you may respond. We're going to solve our problems of Europe, the problems of the world, by dealing with the causes, not the effects. Europe, Europe is more vibrant now because we had the Marshall Plan. We had programs that made Europe more vibrant. We stopped communism in lar large part in Europe, not by talk, not by negative things, but by programs. I think it's very important that people realize that we need programs. But again, I think we can learn something from some parts of Europe. We can learn that some of them are looking down upon the United States and critical of us for some good reasons. We've gotten fat at a very young age in this country. We aren't even 200 years old. And this campaign has got to be one where we start to develop, develop a new nation. We start really getting involved and the vision we got to have is the vision that Kennedy was giving us of a vibrant seconds. America. Black and white, city and suburb, young and old doing something about it. And if we do something about some of these internal problems, then I think w we can learn something from Europe, and we can learn something about dealing with the causes, not just with the effects. Senator McGovern? I think the greatest uh, contribution we could make to the security of the people of Europe is to continue our efforts to improve east-west uh, relationships between ourselves and the peoples of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. It is that clash of the uh, Cold War uh, between our country on one hand and the Soviet Union and its allies on the other that has split Europe apart. So we ought to press ahead on the matter of arms limitations that would reduce not only our own military spending, but reduce the burden of military spending on the economies uh, of Europe. I want to add, with regard to a point that Mayor Yorty has made twice, that when a senator votes for a defense seconds. appropriation bill, that does not mean he approves everything in that bill. And there is seldom any way that we can separate out those portions of the bill that we oppose. I voted for defense, but I've made clear 
time after time I'm Thank opposed you, Senator to McGovern. Vietnam. Senator uh, I think the question was about Europe and economic matters. Let me say, the number one exporter of shoes to the United States is Italy. I say that my Hartke Burke bill would provide for an import quota and limit those imports tomorrow. Number two, there is special tax consideration given to a foreign country when you take an American corporation and build in a foreign uh, a country their plant. Now, that could be corrected with the Hartke Burke bill. Not a one of these candidates will endorse this measure because of the simple fact that we have, a, have to realize that if the jobs are going to be saved for the shoe worker, for the textile worker and the electronic worker, then a bill of this kind must be the law of the land. Number two, I was the one who warned about the devaluation of the dollar, which would come about if we seconds. did not have a successful international monetary review. Number three, I was the one who fought the dumping from these countries, and I've been fighting it consistently. Number four, I would remove the troops from Germany. They're capable of taking care of themselves, and it would save Thank us you, $14 Hartke. billion. Dollars. We move into round four with my question, gentlemen, and that is, uh, assuming that the war is wound down and that we are out of Vietnam, will there be a moral obligation on the part of this country to provide financial and or military aid to the South Vietnamese government? And we start with Mayor Yorty. Well, certainly, uh, as we get out of the war, and we're getting out very rapidly, we'll be down to 30,000, uh, I think, uh, within a few months, probably, and that'll be just uh, air support and logistic support. Uh, but uh, as we, as they can take, th as soon as they can take that over, too, then we'll be out entirely, and I think the South Vietnamese can uh, take care of themselves. But they will have to have some financial support. After all, the, the communists of North Vietnam have come in there and invaded that country, terrorized it, destroyed it, and uh, they're doing the same thing now in Cambodia, where they even go in and blow up the one refinery they have. They blow up bridges so those farmers can't take their uh, rice to harvest. And so there is going to be a need for some continuing help in Southeast Asia after the hostilities are over. Mr. Cole? In regard to Southeast Asia, <clears throat> no, I've never been over there. And sometimes you don't like to make judgments. A lot of people make judgments about Harlem. They've never been in there. They make judgments about prisons. They've never seen any prisoners. So I, a lot of times I don't like to talk about situations until I've seen some of them. But certainly in South Vietnam, we've seen tremendous corruption in that government over there. And I think we have a responsibility to poor people across this country. And I think we have a responsibility probably to set up some type of coalition <coughs> government over there or help them set up. And I agree with what President Nixon has done in regard to Red China. But I think we've got to do something new. I think one of the things we've got to do is instead of Nixon just going to China. Fifteen seconds. I think when he goes when he goes to Russia, he's got to try to get a three power conference between Red China and the United States and Russia and deal with the general problems that's dividing us as a world. And and look at this with these three powers. Senator McGovern, the question is uh, do we have a moral obligation for military and or financial aid to the South Vietnamese? We have no moral obligation to provide either military or financial aid uh, to the present <laughs> South Vietnamese regime. As a matter of fact, uh, I would cut off such aid to uh, military dictators anywhere in the world, not just in South Vietnam. Uh, General Tu is a man who has dealt with those who disagree with him even non-communist, by putting them in jail, including the presidential candidate who ran against him uh, four years ago. He is not the kind of a leader who deserves one dollar of American support. Now, we do have a moral obligation, once this war has ended, to assist in the reconstruction of the war-torn areas, just as we helped rebuild Germany and Japan and Europe at the end of World War II, we ought to extend technical and economic assistance to the peoples of Southeast Asia once the war has ended. Senator Hartke. We have a moral obligation to people, people here at home and people all over the world. We do not have a moral obligation to those people which exceeds that of our own nation. I think the American people have seen the foreign aid of the United States used to purposes which it was never originally intended. I would hope that we'd stop this business of unilateral foreign aid. 
that if we're going to involve ourselves in any type of foreign assistance to any other countries, that it should be done not by the United States alone, but by the other nations of the world who are able to help through the United Nations. This is the type of program which I think must be dealt with very deliberately and very carefully because we have too many people here at home who need attention, who are being neglected. And I do not want to see American have its own seconds. neglected in a situation where we're giving to others things we cannot give to ourselves. Senator Muskie. The fact is, of course, that it is our firepower and our bombing which has contributed a great deal to the devastation of South Vietnam and other areas of Vietnam. When this war is over, therefore, I do think we have a moral obligation to help in the task of reconstruction. domestic issues and looking down the road a bit, the percentage in this century, the percentage of, of gross national product that's gone to the public sector has increased from something on the order of 8% to 40%. That line continues at some point we get to 110%. Do you see any change in that straight line occurring within your proposed administration? And if not, when would such a change set in? And the questioning will, the answers will begin rather with Mr. Cole. I'd like to divert, if I can, from that question, because my campaign is not geared just to deal with economics. My campaign is to deal with the questions of what makes a nation move. And I think what we've got to face in America, in this campaign, again, is why have we become passive? Now, David Broder can write up in the Washington Post about, about why most American people have become turned off. Or we can talk about how we lost faith in, in people in government. We've all lost faith because people in government have made up slogans, like believe Muskie, or things will really change if McGovern's there. We've got to believe in ourselves. We've got to believe that the people can affect politics, in, in economics, in civil rights, in seconds. youth. And the students have to believe. They have to believe two things. Number one, that we've got to tackle our problems. Num number two, they just can't talk. And it's immoral for 200,000 students to be sitting up in Boston, three minutes away from poverty, and be philosophizing. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Richard, would you restate your question, please, for Senator <coughs> McGovern? Yes, I, I'm just uh, projecting the, st the straight line in this century from perhaps 6% of the gross national product going to the public sector to a present nearly 40%. If that trend continues, the, the gov government will be taking 110%, which is obviously impossible. Do you see any change in that direction within your term, and if not, at what point? Well, first of all, I, I deny your statement. I don't believe it's factual to say that 40 percent of the gross national product is going to the uh, public sector. But even if one accepted that, which, which I do not, the more important question is how we uh, spend the money that's going to the public sector. The fact is that when one looks at the uh, federal budget today and rules out the Social Security Trust Fund and those things that the Congress can't control from year to year, we're allocating about two-thirds of the operating budget of the United States government to military purposes. So if you want to cut down on the public sector, the place to cut is to begin eliminating this overkill capacity that we're now uh, wasting on military expenditures seconds. that hurt the country. That means not only ending the war and reducing surplus forces in Western Europe, but it means eliminating some of the boondoggles that add nothing to our defense and waste money that we need on housing and health care and education. Thank you, Senator McGovern. Senator Hartke. In the field of economics, I feel that this is the one distinguishing feature between me and every other candidate in the field, including those in Florida. I believe in an expanding economic concept. I do not believe in this present program of austerity and restrictive economic thinking. This America can expand and take care of its population. I will say this, unless we do, we are going to have an increase in population and we're going to be fighting for that central pie. And it means a reduced standard of living. Unless we have an expanding economic concept where we get rid of the tight money theory, get rid of the high interest rate theory, get rid of the high tax policy, this country is doomed for very serious problems. I mean of the type of higher unemployment, greater disuse of our industrial plant, and the net result will be a bigger and seconds. bigger deficits. That's the cause of the deficit now. 
than this field in the Finance Committee and on the Commerce Committee. I have been taking the lead and have been asserting this proposition for years. I hope and pray that we'll turn this country around in the right direction Thank now. you, Senator Hartke. Senator Muskie. I think the straight line projection that's been posed by the question is misleading. I don't know the accuracy of the figures. But in any case, if you look over the period which the question put to us, and in that period, the standard of living of the Ameri average American has grown and increased tremendously. So it's possible for us to improve our private lives and still do a decent job at our public responsibilities. Now, the fact is that there are public responsibilities with respect to job opportunities, with respect to decent housing, with respect to good neighborhoods, with respect to safe streets, with respect to good schools, with respect to a fair distribution of the burden of these services. And seconds. that is the responsibility upon which my administration would focus so that we began to do the things that relate to the day-to-day -day problems of our people. Thank you. Mayor Yorty. Well, I think, of course, we have to have an expanding economy to afford all the services that people are demanding of government. And uh, I think also, though, that you can't cut national defense, uh, as has been suggested, I believe, by Senator McGovern. As far as I'm concerned, while the Russians are ahead of us in many categories now and are overtaking us in the others, Admiral Rickover says that 95 percent of the American people now live within range of Russian undersea launch missiles. Well, I wouldn't say that that's a, a time to stop building our own undersea launch uh, system so we can have longer range missiles or a time to vote against the safeguard anti-ballistic missile defensive system since the Russians already have one. I don't want to put dollars ahead of the lives of another generation of young men because seconds. our weakness has already caused several generations to march off to war where strength would have prevented it. But now in expanding the economy, I've not only pointed out that these senators killed the supersonic transport program and all those useful jobs, they also all, vo all voted against guaranteeing a loan to Thank Lockheed. you, Mayor Yorty. <laughs> Your one minute is up, and we move into round six with Pete Morrison, and Senator McGovern will respond first. A group came into New Hampshire not too long ago hoping to make the <clears throat> voluntary prayer in public schools an issue. I'm wondering, as president, would you support a constitutional amendment which would permit the voluntary prayer in public schools? No, I would not. I think uh, one of the crucial precepts in the whole uh, American system is the separation of church and state, and I would not uh, violate that uh, simply to suit the convenience of a particular uh, religious group. If we start down uh, that trail, uh, there is no end to where it may lead, and we may lose one of the most uh, precious privileges we have in this country, uh, which is the right to worship God in our own way. Uh, if we need more prayer in this country, and perhaps we do, the responsibility rests more on the home and the family and the church than it does in shifting that burden to the schools. I think the schools are already heavily burdened with tasks seconds. that we've shifted that ought to be borne uh, by those of us in our families and our homes I don't want to add another doubtful uh, constitutional responsibility on the schools. Senator Hartke. I would oppose any mandatory prayer by any single uh, group in the school. I do think that there is absolutely room in our school system to have a time set aside in which there could be silent prayer, in which each person, including the teacher and the children, could pray in their own way, in their own method, to their own God as they saw fit. And if some of them didn't want to pray, I suppose that they uh, would not pray at all. But I do not believe that we want to force anyone to give a prayer which is not of his own choosing. And I think that's elementary. We are a nation which has a great historical background and belief in religious concepts. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. The brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God certainly is not an item with which anyone should find any sincere disagreement. Let me talk just a second, though, on something else. I do not believe that we should carry that distinction so far as to deny, a, deny aid to parochial schools. We've done it on the college level already. And there's no reason to force some of these good schools you, out Senator of Harkey. existence because of lack Senator of Senator Muskie, uh, you may respond to the question. <clears throat> may I make clear first that I, I believe in prayer and have practiced it all my life. I do not believe the Supreme Court has held 
that any American is design, uh, denied the right to pray voluntarily in any spare moment that he or she has in or out of school. The question really relates to whether or not some form of non-denominational prayer should be fashioned by somebody and then applied to the students in the school. I don't believe in that. I think that voluntary prayer should be what comes to the individually as a result of his religious upbringing or whatever motivation he feels within himself. That sort of thing has not been prohibited by the courts and seconds. should not be. Mayor Yorty. Well, I think the United States Supreme Court was legislating uh, when they stretched the constitutional provision against the establishment of religion to say that you can't have voluntary prayers in school. Because I believe in the voluntary prayer, and I think all of us here, we believe in a supreme being. Uh, I think it's very blind to think that there's no divine intelligence, guiding intelligence in this great universe. Uh, to deny that uh, gets over into what the communists preach, the dialectics of materialism, that we're just all victims of forces over which we have no control, that there's no soul in man. And of course, that's the reason they're willing to throw away lives like they do with their uh, aggressive acts. So I do believe in the, in the voluntary prayer, and I would support a constitutional amendment uh, to make it possible. No particular denominational prayer, seconds. and no one forced to pray, but I do believe if you want to have a voluntary prayer in the schools, you should be allowed to do it. Mr. Cole? I believe in religion. A religion of Pope John, which was one of action, out of talk. And I think that we have to realize that a lot of people don't believe in God anymore, or religion. And we've got to convince people that religion is one of action. And some of the things maybe the people could do in New Hampshire to do something about it, they could foster newspapers that talk about brotherhood. I have a copy here of the Union Leader. That's what that represents, that paper. That's garbage. First class garbage, that paper. You know, and I don't call if I care if I call somebody a Canuck, they can call me a Mick. That doesn't mean anything. And that paper perpetuates negativism that's the worst paper in the country. My criticism, though, of Senator Muskie is, though, he went after the, the worst paper in the country with the worst argument. Fifteen seconds. He should have went after him for the Kerner Commission. He could have went after him for things that they've gone out against, instead of just himself personally. And he could have set up a new newspaper in this state, maybe, to get a better newspaper and a better voice in this state, because that paper is terrible. Next round of questioning will begin with Senator Hartke, and the question will be asked by Rod Paul. I'd like to uh, ask each, each of you gentlemen how you would deal with what I observe to be a certain growing public alarm at so many government agencies, the FBI, the CIA, branches of the armed services, uh, watching the public, looking into their affairs. Uh, can you respond to this? I certainly can. I think that uh, all of us share that common fear that uh, big government is looking over our shoulder and interfering with our private life. There's no reason for the CIA to be investigating people in the United States. There's no reason for the FBI to be investigating anyone except those who are criminals or who are suspected of being criminals. There's no reason for the Army to be engaged in this type of activity in the United States as was, as was recently uh, shown in some of the congressional reports. The job of the Congress in this field as in so many fields, is to reassert its independence, to reassert its authority. And I've fought for that, and I will continue to fight to make sure that the Congress is a co-equal branch of government. And seconds. even as president, I would think that we should have the Congress as the last repository of the public will. Senator Muskie. Yes, I think this trend is, is, is alarming indeed, and I must say I compliments Senator Irvin of North Carolina, who's conducted extensive hearings on the extent to which government is acting uh, in a way to uh, violate the privacy and the secrecy of, uh, of, of private life. We've had a couple of developments in the last year which uh, disclose it in, its, uh, in, in, in a bad form. The surveillance of Earth Day activities, the surveillance of activities of other citizens unrelated to national security in any way. I've introduced a couple of uh, pieces of legislation that are designed to, to aim at this trend. I introduced a Truth in Government Act, which is designed to rationalize the classification procedure to ensure seconds. that we use it less 
and that declassification takes place sooner. I've also proposed a domestic intelligence review board set up to review the very kinds of activities the question poses. Rod, would you rephrase the question now as we uh, go to Mayor Yorty? Yes, Mayor Yorty, my question was, uh, how would you deal with growing public alarm at uh, so many government agencies uh, looking over our shoulder? Well, I don't believe there's any great uh, public alarm over agencies looking over our shoulder. I think there's a lot of alarm among left-wing groups, and uh, they cause a big fuss. But uh, none of us approve, of course, of an unfair invasion of privacy. But I certainly wouldn't uh, carry this thing to the point of attacking the FBI. As here McGovern assails Hoover, and FBI, musky ass review of FBI says action. Uh, I realize that the FBI has a great responsibility for our internal security. And uh, they can't be every place any more than my police department can't. And so they try to infiltrate groups uh, that uh, might be guilty of plotting to set bombs off, as was done in Manchester uh, recently. And of course, they, the communists, the subversives, extreme militants seconds. are extremely afraid of being infiltrated, so they attack the FBI, and they love candidates who join them in the attack. Thank you, Mayor Yorty. Mr. Cole? I don't think any of these candidates on my left, with the exception possibly, I don't know, Mayor Yorty, are against the FBI. I think they're pretty happy we have an FBI. I'm glad we have an FBI, and I think it does a pretty good job. I think there's a lot of liberals who are too darn critical. I agree with you that on, on that, Mayor, Mayor Loeb. But in regard to the FBI, I think many people use it as a cop-out. The FBI is not stopping us from tackling the problems of poverty. The FBI and Agnew's criticism isn't stopping from people getting involved personally. And I think we have, have to have the FBI take a look at maybe the MUL, the Manchester Union leader, because I think that causes more violence than SDS ever thought about. And that paper is, you know, that paper ought to go down in history. That paper ought to go down in history is probably the, 15 seconds. the most progressive voice for ancient history that ever came. It's really creative. They can really call Muskie a phony, McGovern a this, and so on and so forth. And I don't know if are you, Mayor Loeb or Yorty, uh, I don't know how you defend that paper. Senator McGovern? Well, I think it's ridiculous to say that the uh, question here is whether or not we believe in an FBI or, or whether we don't. The question is uh, whether that and other uh, agencies of the government, including the Army, are carrying out their mission when they uh, spy on the meetings where United States senators are speaking, where students are gathered to talk about uh, saving the environment. Uh, when I've criticized the uh, director of the FBI, it was because I thought he spent too much time uh, snooping into the lives of ordinary citizens and not doing enough about the problems of the underworld, the drug racketeers, the mafia, and the criminals that are making life uh, unsafe in this country. These are the kind of activities that those uh, interested in the security of the United States ought to be concentrating on. And one of the reasons I oppose the nomination of Mr. Kleindienst as Attorney General is that I think he's more interested in wiretapping and snooping than he is in good law enforcement. Thank you, Senator McGovern. Gentlemen, a great deal of comment by presidential candidates about uh, full-time employment and a guaranteed income. If you were president, how would you make it possible, Senator Muskie? Well, I think we must uh, do several things uh, with respect uh, to the economy. First of all, uh, we've got to re uh, end the war. I think that's an economic decision, as I've indicated earlier. Secondly, uh, we've got to take the measure to stimulate consumer buying, consumer confidence. Uh, the tax po policy that this administration adopted was aimed at stimulating investment, which we did not need. Having done this, I think we need to make uh, training programs available to people who are put out of work, who need new skills. Those training programs ought to be geared to the specific job requirements of industry as it emerges in particular areas. I think we ought to make government the employer of last resort with public service employment, if necessary. 15. I think it would be cheaper to guarantee work than to guarantee welfare to those who are displaced. Thank you. Mayor Yorty? Yes, first of all, let me say that I, I don't think you can criticize the FBI for covering a meeting of the Peace Action Coalition with the kind of speakers that were going to speak there just because a senator happened to speak on the same platform. That's the senator's business if he wants to associate with those kind of people. I really believe in the field of jobs, 
that every man or woman who wants a job is entitled to one. And I think that uh, if we want to protect our free enterprise system, which I do, we must make it work for all the people. And it won't work for all the people unless they're included in it. If a man or woman wants a job and uh, is told there is none, he's not included in the American economy. He's excluded, so he has no desire to protect the free enterprise system. So I speak to business people, labor, and others. And I tell them we must make full seconds. employment a reality. And of course, if there are not jobs in the private sector, we've got to give people <coughs> jobs in training so that they can return to the private sector, train for jobs that are available. And uh, I don't pretend that this won't cost money, because it will cost money, and you can't do it by adding to the public debt. We're going to have to reform Thank you the very much, Mayor Yorty. Uh, Mr. Cole, uh, again, my question is the great deal of comment from presidential candidates about full-time employment and guaranteed income. When you're old enough to run for the presidency, uh, and if you were elected, uh, how would you implement both? Well, I guess one of the things I would try to do is, well, one thing is I don't think you have to be old enough to bring out s certain things. For one thing, talking about FBI and things we ought to have in government. Wouldn't it be interesting if somebody proposed we put some guy like Ralph Nader in the cabinet? I think he'd do something for consumers in this country. Uh, but getting back to the problem of unemployment, you got to get back to the rat again. Want to save money? You you stop crime by an offense, not a defense. You stop it by getting jobs. You stop it. Every teacher out there and every parent. You ask your teachers why that Kerner Commission hasn't been in your school. That deals with the problem of racism. Black and whites can get it together in this country, but we've got to move toward that direction until we tackle the problem of racism and bring it out. It hasn't been brought seconds. out in New Hampshire by most of these candidates. In fact, all of them. Until we tackle the problem of the Kerner Commission in this campaign and the problem of racism, we're never going to do anything about unemployment. And the poor will suffer more, and the poor black. And brother, they're suffering tonight. Thank you. Senator McGovern, your response. I think we could have a, a full employment economy in this country with every man and woman working who wanted a job if we invested our federal resources uh, properly. And that's why I have stressed here tonight that it's not enough simply to say we're going to build more houses and have better health care and more schools, more public transit facilities, more programs of all kinds. We have to say where the money's going to come from. I provided for a total of $60 billion, about half of it coming from closing loopholes for the rich and the powerful in the tax laws, and the others coming from eliminating waste in the military sector of our budget. If we invested resources on that scale in seconds. meeting the needs of our country here at home, there isn't the slightest doubt that we would have a full employment economy providing a decent job for everyone. Senator Hartke. Uh, Senator Muskie, I'm delighted that you picked up my phrase, guaranteed work, not guaranteed welfare. Now all you need to do is go down and put your name on the bill, and you and Senator McGovern, we can get on the road. It's a question of leadership in this nation in the field of economics. We certainly can put everyone to work. It's been the national policy since 1946, the full employment of this nation. But uh, your economic advisors say if you get back to 4% unemployment, you'll be satisfied. Nixon says 5%. I say 0% unemployment. And this is possible in this country. And it can be done. It can be done immediately by using the government wherever the private sector fails. But the private sector would provide more jobs if you pass the Hartke Burke bill and limit imports. The private sector would have more jobs if you passed the thousand dollar exemption and gave the 20 percent increase in Social Security. What I'm talking about is an economic package. I'm talking about a plan for the future based upon my record of achievement in the past. This is the economic guts of this country that I'm talking about. What makes a country run and move. And that's what I want to do. I want this country to have opportunity. Thank you very much. Senator Harkey and gentlemen, uh, that concludes the questioning and answer period, and we're about to go into our closing statements now. Uh, as we look on the podiums, we notice that not many of you have touched your water. We went to great expense to put it there, so I hope that you'll take advantage of it. <laughs> the candidates will now make closing statements. These statements will be restricted to three minutes each, and I'll tell them when two minutes and 30 seconds have passed, as is my job, and also when their time is up. The order of speaking was determined by another draw prior to the beginning of this program. <coughs> and the order of speaking will be first Senator McGovern, then uh, Senator Hartke, Mr. Cole, Mr. Muskie, and Mayor Yorty. Now let's begin with the closing statements and Senator McGovern. I 
think the very first uh, question on tonight's uh, program is one that is on the mind of many voters across the state of New Hampshire, and that is how we can restore some greater measure of confidence in those who seek and hold uh, office in this country. During the last few days, the news has been dominated by evidence that the man designated by President Nixon as the next Attorney General of the United States may very well have been involved in a $400,000 campaign contribution to the Republican Party, which influenced the administration to drop an antitrust suit against the officers of the corporation making that contribution. Now, it's because of that kind of disturbing evidence of the serious uh, corroding power of money on politics in this country today that I have felt it was absolutely essential before the New Hampshire voters uh, go to the polls on Tuesday that they understand who is financing the campaigns of the various candidates. I have publicly disclosed that the names and the amount of every contributor who has supported in any way uh, the McGovern campaign. It seems to me that those other candidates who are asking for the trust of the people ought to be willing to make the same kind of public disclosure. I also think in the interest of restoring uh, credibility in the government of the United States, we have to do more than simply talk about all the new priorities and the new programs that we're going to launch if we're elected President of the United States. It's all well and good to talk about tax reform in general terms, but I have spelled out very carefully in this campaign three areas in which some $28 billion can be saved in specific uh, tax reform. By putting an end to this system that permits millionaires to escape uh, paying any taxes at all, by restoring the corporate tax rate to where it was in 1960, and by limiting the amount of money that any one person can inherit in his lifetime. I've also spelled out a military defense budget that will actually make this country stronger than it is today. It's built on the premise that we ought not to spend one more dollar on military operations than we need for the defense of America. We now have the capacity to blow up the entire world 30 10 or 12 times over. The Soviet Union probably has the same capacity, and it's a ridiculous argument to say that we need to kill everybody more than 10 times over. The time has come to begin redeeming our own country, to put America on the side of peace and a more humane society, not only for the citizens of this land, but for people all around the world. Thank you, Senator McGovern. Senator Hartke? I think this campaign is going to demonstrate whether or not the person-to-person -person type of campaigning that a poor boy from southern Indiana named Vance Hartke has been doing is any more possible in this country, or whether or not we are going to surrender to the big money people, to the big organization people, and to those who can spend millions of dollars in a campaign. My whole effort has been to tell you that I have a record of achievement of which I'm extremely proud. As I said in Social Security, I don't come to you and promise 20% without having done something in the past. In offering a $1,000 exemption in, tax, in the taxes and reduction, I do not come to you without having offered a record in the past. And something that's been forgotten in this whole policy is the veterans. I'm chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee, and I say to you, the veteran of today receives about half of what I received when I came back from World War II. And I think that should be corrected, certainly. A veteran should not be cre uh, treated as a second-class citizen. And little things, like rubella. I went and found out how much it would take to eliminate and eradicate rubella, German measles, the principal cause of retarded children in America. I passed the law, and President Nixon took that money and put it in budgetary reserve, and 20,000 additional retarded children were born in America. I've been introducing for years all of the legislation on behalf of the blind people of this nation. I was the co-author of the Automobile Safety Act. I authored the Railway Safety Act, the Cooperative Education Act, the Adult Education Act, the Guaranteed Loan Program. This is a record, but the issue here is leadership. I cannot do everything I want to do for my country, merely as a senator. The country's been good to me. I have no complaint. I have a loving wife and seven children. 
Everything that I've had in this world has been because somebody else has helped me along the way. So as far as I'm concerned, all I can offer in return is to help others who have not been helped. And that's what I want to do. I want to make love. I want to make charity. I want to make faith. I want to make these things, not alone something we learned about in, in church and in our Sunday school or even talked about in school. I want to make those realities in our life. I want to make this nation, again, the nation of, of great drive and energy. I want to move it forward. I want it to have fire. I want it to have initiative, drive, and energy to go ahead and say this nation is not at the height of its, its uh, power less than 200 years before it is coming to an end. The celebration of 1976 should be a recreation of the American democracy, not the destruction of our dream. We should grasp that dream and make it a reality. This is what the country needs. It expects it. The people certainly can expect no less from their next president. 30 seconds, sir. Uh, now we move to the gentleman who drew third in our closing statements, uh, Mr. Edward Cole. Mr. Cole. For the last eight years of my life, I haven't been involved in the Senate. I've been involved with the people of this country. I ask for you to vote for me on Tuesday, because a vote for me would be a vote against politics as usual will not elect me president, but it will get people maybe realizing that we've got to have a higher quality of government. We've got to have leadership, not bullshit. And this campaign has been a lot of bull in a lot of ways because we've ignored the key issues. I think the, camp I think the election is between myself and Senator McGovern. I thought you had credibility, Senator Hartke, until you came out this morning and praising the union leader for the coverage of you, even though they crucified some of the other people around here. I think it's between myself and Senator McGovern. Mary Yorty, we've heard him. He's a voice of the past. Ancient history with the warriors and the Spartans back there. You know, not admitting he's even wrong in Vietnam and having the support of William Loeb. And Senator Muskie. Senator Muskie has given a lot of dedication to this government. My criticism of him is not as a person. It's the style of his campaign. This debate is late. It's the late debate. It could have been four weeks ago. He didn't agree to it. He agreed to debate Loeb. He debated Loeb, but he could have debated the other candidates four weeks ago and brought it out into the open. Financial disclosures, my campaign is financed by myself. I think these should be brought out. I think if somebody's going to be the new Lincoln, he's got to challenge the public, and perhaps he can. But this is the spirit, I think. We've got to bring the spirit of Bobby Kennedy back into the Democratic Party and that fire, because it isn't what we're saying around here. It's what we feel about this country. And this is what my campaign is all about, to get the public involved again in America. And let's build a new frontier. Let's have not politics as usual, politics as usual that doesn't challenge, doesn't talk about the problems of race, the problems of division. It promises. I don't promise anything tonight. I challenge. We've got to get moving in this country. You demand the national networks give debates all around this country. You demand that the current commission gets into that schools. You demand a higher standard of journalism in this country. Because my criticism isn't just of Loeb. My criticism of papers like the New York Times and some of these papers that have let the public forget about the current commission. We've got to realize that the most important person in this country is you. The American public have got to believe. Don't be paralyzed by bigness. Talking about being practical, I didn't spend $1.6 million to come up here to New Hampshire. I spent about $3,000. But with that $3,000, we helped about 100 kids. If these same gentlemen spent that kind of money helping people instead of putting it into television stations in Boston, they could have helped 66,000 kids in this state. We can't put all this money just into campaigning. We've got to put it into service. So the challenge in 1972 is let's not have politics as usual. And a vote for me on Tuesday, top name on the ballot, will be a vote against politics as usual. And if you don't vote for me, I'll be working Wednesday. Revitalization Corps, we need help all around this country. Because we're going to get this country moving again this year. That's the new Thank frontier. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole. We're into the section of our debate format where we're <coughs> hearing the closing statements from the five Democratic candidates on the New Hampshire Tuesday uh, Democratic presidential primary. And next is Senator Edmund Muskie. Senator Muskie. Since McGo Mr. McGovern, in his opening state or his closing statement raised the question of campaign disclosures and has done so in recent days i'd like to make a brief statement on it 
I have disclo disclosed the sources of contributions to my campaign for the presidency. I was the first candidate to do so. No other candidate followed my lead <coughs> until almost two years after my first reports were filed. After I opened my national office in Washington, and before I was an announced candidate, I decided to file regular public reports with the clerk of, representative, uh, clerk of the House of Representatives, and I did so in 1970. Senator McGovern, who was also active in 1970, did not follow my lead. He did not do so in 1971, after he became an announced candidate, and he has not yet filed reports for 1970. Because of the failure of Senator McGovern and other candidates to follow my lead, I decided we needed a policy that applied to all candidates, including the President of the United States. Accordingly, I urged disclosure legislation. That legislation will take effect on April 7th and will apply to all candidates. Now if I may turn to the real issues of this campaign, and they have to do with creating a sense of community in this country. And by a sense of community, I mean the sense that in this country, in this national community, there is a place in it for everyone, whoever he or she is. There is not that now, for a very simple reason. We simply haven't applied our resources, our will, and our commitment to that objective in recent years. What our people are looking for, all of them, is good jobs and the opportunity for better ones, decent housing within the reach of even the least of our people, good neighborhoods, where it is safe to walk the streets, not only in the daytime, but at the nighttime. Good schools, where any child from any background can build a future for himself or herself. And a fair distribution of the burdens of supporting public services. This is all, what all our people are looking for. Here in New Hampshire and northern New England, as well as in the ghettos of our country. And we must break through the barriers that deny these things to too many of our people. That means ending the war. 30 seconds. It means revitalizing our economy. It means reshaping our national budgets. It means improving the relationships between the three levels of government. Most of all, it means caring about what happens to each other. And if we do this and elect a president on that basis, we can rebuild our country and rebuild the lives of our people. Mayor Yorty, you may begin your closing statement now. Well, as I said at the start, I feel that I'm contending here with members of the left-wing liberal bloc in the United States Senate, and I don't really think they have much to debate each other about. Uh, the biggest fight seems to be over where Senator Muskie's money comes from and why he won't publish it. But I don't think that's uh, any real issue in the campaign at all. I'm sure that many honorable people are putting up money for Mr. Muskie's campaign, and it, it looks rather plentiful. As a matter of fact, I envy him, uh, his ability to raise that amount of money. But uh, the real issues in this, in this United States, as I see it, you find these candidates all on the same side. Uh, here's a little article from a newspaper that Muskie defends draft dodgers, and it tells that Senator McGovern started talking about amnesty for these people, <laughs> evidently a blanket amnesty, before the war is even over, and then Mr. Muskie uh, backs him. And I just don't believe in talking about any blanket amnesty to draft dodgers where our men are still fighting in Vietnam. When the war is over, yes, we'll look at each case individually, but no blanket uh, amnesty. And of course, they all ran back to, to Washington to vote for forced busing, which I've never believed in. I don't care what the polls were saying at any time. I've always felt that uh, little kids have a constitutional right to stay in their own neighborhoods and go to school. I think that all schools should be equal and high quality but uh, little children should not be forced to be bussed a long ways off against their consent and against their parents' consent to go to schools. Now, uh, Mr. Hartke mentioned about the import of shoes, and I recognize the fact that there was a time when we could compete with cheap imports because their labor was cheap, but we used machinery. Now they've taken our technology, and you add technology to cheap labor, and in many cases we can't compete, and we're going to have to put some limitations, and probably by reciprocal agreements, on some of these imports to protect our local industries. Incidentally, I was read a statement the other day by Abraham Lincoln analyzing this whole situation. Um, he made it in 1843 before 
he went to Congress, and he was for protecting American industry. Well, of course, I believe in the policies of President Truman. When I was in Congress, we didn't run up these huge deficits. I once voted for a tax bill that I regarded as a bad bill because President Truman asked me to, because he said it's a bad bill, but I wish my friends would vote for it. We need the money. He didn't believe in the huge deficits. These senators have all served in Congress while the national debt has gone up tremendously. Thirty-seven billion dollars under Johnson, and then, of course, Nixon came along and said that he was going to balance the budget and give us sound economics. Well, he balanced the budget all right. He gave us a recession, and uh, then he gave us the biggest deficits in the history of this country under comparable circumstances. One hundred billion dollars in four years. President Truman had a debt of 1.6 in eight years, so you can see the difference in these men. And, of course, uh, when, uh, when Senator McGovern says that maybe the Russians have the same capacity to kill, he knows he's kidding because they're ahead of us in national defense. What I'm really trying to do is to talk sense to the American people, as Adlai Stevenson tried to do some years ago. Thank you very much, Mayor Yorty. We find ourselves, gentlemen, uh, strangely enough, with about uh, a, a minute or so uh, of time left. And I would like to just pose one question to you, and I'll start with Senator McGovern, sort of anticlimactic. And that is that we understand there are reports of a debate in, in Florida for the Florida primary. We want to know if you'd give us your comment on it. Well, I, I've been trying to uh, encourage debates in this campaign uh, everywhere in the country because I still think it's the best way to give the voters a clear indication of what the differences are uh, between the candidates. These long-range exchanges of charges and countercharges uh, won't do it. There is a good possibility of a debate uh, taking place in Florida uh, involving at least uh, Mayor Lindsay and myself and I think possibly the other Fine. candidates. We'd like to get the reaction of all of the gentlemen here. So, Senator Hartke? I would hope we'd have lots of debates and I would hope also that we could come sometime in this country to the proposition where we could end this high financing and big organizational type politics and go on with a system in where uh, no one had to ever question the financing of a campaign. I'm in favor of it. I think the question of leadership is so uh, substantial. Thank you very much, Senator. Senator Muskie. Well, I have no objection to debates in principle. My problem is I'm spread over more primaries and more of the early ones than other candidates, and more difficult to allocate my time to make a maximum impact in each of these states. Debates aren't necessarily the best way. Fine. Thank you. Mayor Yorty? Well, I believe in debate, but of course this is no debate. It's just uh, answering questions uh, by each uh, candidate for one minute, in which you certainly can't answer a question properly in one minute. If you could have a real debate, then, of course, you'd have to have something like Lincoln-Douglas, where you have a specific subject you're going Thank to debate, you very much. and you've got to question and answer. Mayor Yorty, uh, Mr. Cole, I'm not sure whether you're in Florida or not, but no, you I'm must... I'm not in Florida. Yeah. If they want to invite me down, I'll go. But seriously, in regard to debates, we should have had them here a long time ago. And Senator Muskie, you know, you didn't want to debate up here. You didn't want to debate up here until the last day, and you know it. And another name, and the style campaign. Thank you very much, is Mr. Richard Cole. Thank you. And the, the question, of course, was on a debate in Florida, not New Hampshire. Uh, now, gentlemen uh, of the panel, uh, before we go into our close here, uh, been a great deal of comment about uh, the significance of the primary system. Rod Paul, uh, as an observer of the political scene, how do you feel about it? The, the significance of, of this primary or any? Well, I think the significance of the primary on the candidates is one thing. The significance of the primary on New Hampshire might well be another. Uh, I'm curious to see what happens to the state after you people leave. That's my comment. Dick Noyes? <laughs> well, it's a fairly substantial change in the electoral process, it seems to me. The primary originally was a method for a particular group of people, an organized, uh, disciplined group of people, to choose their own candidate, but in increasingly we're enlarging that and it's becoming a part of the generalized election process. I, it, it's a change, I'm not sure whether for the better. Pete, our time is up, but thank you very much, gentlemen. Our guests have been the Democratic candidates for president on the March 7th New Hampshire primary ballot. Edward Cole of Hartford, Connecticut, Senator George McGovern of South Dakota, Senator Vance Hartke of Indiana, Senator Edmund Muskie of Maine, and Mayor Sam Yorty of Los Angeles. And also our thanks to uh, Richard Noyes, editor and publisher of the Salem, New Hampshire Observer, Peter Morrison, news director of WKBR Radio in Manchester, Rod Paul, political editor of the Concord, New Hampshire Monitor. The purpose of this debate, bringing the Democratic candidates in New Hampshire together for the first time in the campaign, has been to help keep the voter more fully informed. We hope we've done that. 
Taking part in the democratic process is important. Voting is a viable force to keep democracy working is at the root of this process. On Tuesday, New Hampshire voters again will be taking part in...